towards the age group athletes. So with that, we'll go through three topics today. One will be we'll talk about the stim stimulus and the response. Um, more about that shortly, of course, but it's really looking at drawing on the insights from professionals and tracking crucial met metrics with age group athletes. Then we'll look a bit about techno overload. I know that in the recent times, especially in the last few years, there's been a lot of rise in technology. There's a lot of things available. So we'll try and go through some of the aspects of what what's good and what's not and what and how to um, and how to really harness some of those technologies and what's the most important. And lastly, mine and, mine and Chelsea is saying is often, often we say make what matters most matter most. And um, I took that and we're going to talk about what we can look at in terms of streamlining our training focus. <clears throat> so the first thing then is, um, you know, when I when I was a PhD student and when I was a student, um, there was two things that was always brought to me by when I was at High Performance Sport New Zealand, especially is the, the question is, as, as a coach, what are the two most important things? Or even as a physiologist, which I was when I was at rowing or some of these other sports, is what are the two most important of factors of training? And they're actually quite simple, and they boil, da boil down to two things. And those two things are the stimulus. So what's the training stimulus? And then what is the response of the athlete? So <clears throat> really simply, it, it means it means is the training that's being, being prescribed eliciting the correct outcome in terms of the physiology, out, physiological outcome? And then the response is, is twofold. Is, is the athlete coping with the training? And then also, if we're targeting a specific area, whether that may, may be VO2 max, it might be anaerobic capacity, is that actually getting improved? And is it is it moving forward? And it sounds quite complicated, but... It's actually, this is what training really boils down to. And it's it's really is that simple that is you, if you have those two parts of the equation covered and the stimulus is correct and the response of the athlete is positive, um, not even if you're looking at the, not even if that you're looking at the actual training and testing and making sure they're improving in that, in that specific area, only if they're actually coping with the training and you can be confident that they are coping with the training and adapting in a positive manner, the athlete will definitely be getting better. And it really is really that simple. So what it what it comes down to is that with a stimulus, this if I want you to take one thing home with you today, it will be this is this this principle that many of you may have heard of before is this that's called the said principle, and it's a, it stands for the specific specific adaptation of imposed demands. So the body's quite smart in that whatever you give it, whatever stimulus you give it, generally it will adapt to that stimulus. It's just like doing weight training in the gym. If you do very, very heavy weights, you will generally get a lot stronger. If you do if you do a lot, a lot of reps, high repetitions and low, low, um, low resistance, you probably won't get as strong. If you train your VO2 max, you'll get better at VO2 max. If you train your threshold, you get better at threshold. And that's a really key key consideration to all training is this this said principle um so with that that means that we do need to think about some very specific things that being um training intensity regulation so making sure that the training intensity is exactly as we say it should be and to achieve that we need to ensure that we do have the correct testing in place whether, whether that be in the lab and we'll talk a bit more about that or using some of the the insights you can use on training peaks or some lab like field based testing that you can actually do and then therefore setting the correct training zones as well So when it comes to training intensity regu uh, regulation, there are basically there's two sides to what we can look at when it looks at, when we're looking at regulating training intensity. So the one side is this extrinsic extrinsic way, which is external of our own internal physiology. So that might be power and pace, um, and then the intrinsic is what's going on within our own internal physiology. So that might be heart rate, it might be lactate, it might be rate of perceived exertion, so how we're feeling within ourselves. Um, it could be VO2 max, and there could be some other things, so more things like SMO2, so muscle, muscle oxygenation, which is becoming more popular. But, you know, there's lots of different ways we can regulate intensity, and it, and it, becomes, um, it becomes more and more... Uh, more and more complicated as more and more technology becomes becomes available. But in essence, 
what we're really trying to um to ascertain with all of this is we're trying to build out two very specific demarcations of intensity so and the first one and this is you can see on this chart here you can see that there's um over here there's there's this there's a moderate moderate intensity heavy intensity severe intensity and then sprint intensity or anaerobic capacity intensity and these are really important to what we talk about the specific adaptation of imposed demands knowing these is very important to to do the correct training or to, to train in the prescribed manner to elicit the exact response so lt being the aerobic threshold maximal metabolic steady state would be equivalent of what many people might know as um, uh, functional threshold power or anaerobic threshold there's lots of interchangeable terms here but um the bottom line is is that these two demarcations are probably the most important demarcations we can get as triathletes and of course there's lots of ways you can you can um you can you can look at this you can go into the lab you can get lab testing um you can do on field testing which might be critical power uh, maximum aerobic fitness, um, FTP testing, um, but there's loads and loads of different ways. And I'm not, I don't really want to get into the details of how we can go and ascertain all those now. But if you do want to read a bit more, I have written two blogs that are quite extensive on finding the first aerobic threshold and finding the the maximum, the FTP, maximal metabolic steady state using field testing as well. Um, so I just want to, I'll just, um, just going to ask, bring Chelsea in on this one because recently, you know, Chelsea's had, um, we've done a lot of testing in the past. She's done field testing. We've done lab testing. And um, I'm sure she, she'll have some something to say around what she's found to be the most beneficial in terms of her, um, in terms of the outcomes of her training. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I think that, you know, there's been a place in our program for both lab testing and field testing. Obviously, like field testing is easier to execute on your own or, you know, when I'm not with you in New Zealand or I don't have access to a lab. So um, I think there's a place for that. But lab testing has been particularly useful for us, especially like at the beginning of the season or um, when we're preparing for a big, very important event, because it allows us to like really dial in my um, my thresholds, as you were talking about. Yeah, and and this picture here, you can see this picture here is one test that we did recently in the lab at my university, and um and uh, but also what you can do is you can have kind of basic testing as well, like in field testing or so within the squad, for example, when someone when a, in our enjoy IQ training squad, when we have an athlete who comes into the um who's into the squad, we always encourage them to do a testing week, and this is just an example of a of a typical testing week that's kind of it's built together so we ensure that the athlete is in a good state to do um to do the testing so we have recovery periods between the tests but you it's made up of three different testing days so we've got a, a your classic 20 minute ftp test there um, a critical swim speed test which consists of a 400 and a 200 meter time trial and then a five kilometer running test as well and they're they're quite simple um tests to do but you can um but using specific percentages we can, we can then plug it into this calculator that will be that you can download through a link in the Training Peaks app, and you can then calculate your own thresholds from that, and it'll bring you out your very specific training zones um, that can then be entered into into Training Peaks. So there's lots of different ways to do it, and we have a number of different testing methods that are included within the squad, but um, and they're also covered in those blogs if you want to read a little bit more about that as well. And last, and if you're really into um, geeking out and you really want to know a bit more about laboratory and field testing and some statistics, we do. I do have a course on this. It's LDT 104. And my former PhD student, um, Dr. Ed Maunder now, um, is that he leads this module and he talks a lot about the differences between um, laboratory and field testing and also how you can um, and how to actually detect some meaningful change. And it's a, a really good course. But the, the really important thing here is that when you do this is that obviously training peaks has the ability to set your training zones and um, and also you can enter in those those threshold values. What we do at Endure IQ is we have very specific percentage, percentages that will ascertain where those where those um, where the LT1 is, where the maximum where the um, and where all those other training zones are. This is where I believe the devil is in the detail in in that you 
I prefer to have a few more zones, and this is where the, the specificity is really key. And you can see here, we, you know, typically we run a recovery, which is L1, endurance L2. But rather than just having an L3, we actually split it into level 3A and level 3B. So this is more kind of your Ironman pace, and then this is more of your kind of your 70.3 half marathon pace. Then we have threshold, and then we have like the level 5 VO2 max, because this is based on heart rate. When it comes to the power values, we have the anaerobic capacity level 6 as well. Not really as not not really as important for um for heart rate because you don't really have um, heart rate values to do with anaerobic capacity, but that's just an example of um where training peaks can really can really bring that in. So next up we have the um the response and as a coach and a coach at Chelsea, you know the the, the two things that I'm always asking is I'm asking you know, is is Chelsea's targeted physiology being altered in with with the said training and. The second question is, is Chelsea coping with the training stress? As you see here, this is um, this is another picture from the testing we did recently. Um, you know, we tested te tested Chelsea in the lab here in New Zealand not, not that long ago, and some things came out of that. The main thing was that we found that, you know, her VT1, her aerobic threshold, her substrate utilization and her efficiency was really, really good. Um, so we didn't really need to go and touch that too much. What we did find is that the VO2 max, her higher values weren't as high as we were hoping. And they were a little bit closer than what we expected. So um, we then went into um, a very specific training regime to try and to try and build those up. And you can see this is just some some examples of of how you can actually use some some things in training piece to see if you're actually getting to grips with those targeted areas. You can use the power profiles. But I also just like to see how when you're using the power profiles, how you can look at where different areas of Chelsea's power, for example, because we were mainly focused on the bike at this point, um, are improving. And like five minute power, for example, is highly related to VO2 max. And there's a great equation, actually. If you measure your VO2 max, there's an equation out there. It's actually quite easy to Google. It will really predict your VO2 max very highly. So we know that five minute power, if that's going up, is going to be, you know, we're actually really improving um, improving the Chelsea's VO2 max at the same time. And during this time, just before I'm in New Zealand, um, Chelsea did do her peak. I think it was the peak best, was it, was it the best ever, wasn't it? The best ever five minute power. Yeah, I think we got pretty close to it. Yeah, close to it. Well, well we did, we, remember, because we did kind of a bit of a durability test. We did five minutes and then two, two, then an hour and a half at VT1 and another five minutes. And both of them were close to her peak ever five minutes, even the one after. So um, so we showed, so pretty confident that we made some good inroads there. And also her, um, the, the 60 minute power was also right up there as well. <laughs> another thing we can do to, to make these targets is just do some simple, um, if you're looking at other things rather than, VO2 max, you can also just look at for the things like aerobic threshold. What I like to look at is the um the power associated with heart rate. So heart rates don't really change that much in terms of thresholds. We've actually published a paper on that. They they really are quite stagnant, particularly with athletes who have been training for a, a very long period of time. Um, so you can use it to see if if you say your VT1 heart rate is 150, you can do specific tests to see how your power is increasing over time or decreasing if you're getting worse to show if you're if you're improving. And the other side of it is, of course, the response. Um, I'm pretty big on heart rate variability. Very fortunate that we have the ability to track heart rate variability using the metrics tab and resting heart rate in the metric tab metrics tab in Training Peaks. So those who don't know, high heart rate variability is a good thing. And you can see here, this is the this is the um, this is the period of time just before Ironman New Zealand, where Chelsea's got nice high high heart rate over here, um, and also she has some um, she also has quite a low resting heart rate. So we know that she's in a very good spot, and this is alongside the um, a time when. TSB is quite low, so training stress balance using the performance management chart, and or the acute training load is quite high. So it's a real good it's a real good indicator to me that even though you know we have some some mainly that's derived from extrinsic metrics, power and pace, we know you know the training load is quite high, but I know that she's coping well because we're having a desired HRV and resting heart rate response. And with for me, that means that if I know that the training stimulus is correct. And I know that the response is correct. I know that we're going to be 
in a pretty good space and moving forward to um, having a, a pretty pretty successful successful race day. And finally, just on this, within the squad, we have, you know, we, within the Enjoy Q training squad, HRV can be quite complicated. So we always have this like flow chart that where, where athletes can kind of make a decision on what's, to, what's going on with the HRV. And at the end of every week, we have a little note of a decision tree to know whether you should insert a recovery period into your own training based on based on based on your own internal responses and of course the rest was history um chelsea did pretty well in um in taupo so it looked like we did have the desired response and the desired stimulus um chelsea won and um broke the course record at the same time and which which wasn't a very nice day it wasn't a very favorable day either was it chelsea yeah it was pretty pretty gnarly out there especially on the swim <laughs> and, and it's a headwind or for those who don't know taupo is a it's a course that's um it's basically it's two laps but it's out and back so you've got 45k out 45k back and most years and i've done that race a lot of times most years you have a tailwind on the way home which is quite favorable but unfortunately this year you had a very strong headwind all the way home which um which wasn't that uh which didn't didn't make for fast times but um somehow chelsea managed it so yeah um anyway so that's um that that takes care of, that's kind of stimulus and response and talking a bit about a bit about that but the next part is um this techno overload so of course this day and age we have a lot of technology we have aura rings we have hrv we have power meters we have glucose meters we have vo2 we have smo2 spo2 lactate we have lots of lots and lots of different ways that we can monitor ourselves and i think as age group athletes and i mean even for myself as a coach um you know I, I even see all these other coaches using all this other equipment and to me it's sometimes even a little bit overwhelming but i think when it comes to age group athletes and i think the main thing we have to draw is that as age group athletes we're very time poor um we don't have as much time as the pros so you have to consider more than just the benefit of what the what the technology does. And I always bring it back to this cost benefit versus cost benefit analysis. And what I mean by that, and I'll just use heart rate variability as a as an explanation or as an example. When when I first started doing my PhD, for example, I had to use a um I use a polar RS eight hundred. You have to do five minutes of sitting, five minutes of standing. Um, it took a very long time to do it, and over time. We've just learned a lot more. We've gone from just using one, one metric of HRV, and then we went to one minute and we got to use apps. And now we're in this position where we have basically wearables and we can do it during sleep. So the cost used to be very high, but now the cost is very low and it's really, really easy to monitor your HRV. For example, I've got a Whoop on now. I take it at night. You could use Aura Ring. They're all great devices and, um, and they're really good. And so therefore, the cost is actually really, really low now. And the benefit, I believe, is really, really high, at least in HRV. Um, so if we look at a few of the other, other, this is my take on some of the, the um, stimulus versus response and the cost versus the benefit. So I think the power and the pace and the heart rate, the green being the benefit, the red being the cost, it's a no-brainer. This is something that I believe all athletes should have in their training. Um, but then as we get into the other the other aspects of muscle oxygenation, like moxie, lactate, VO2, they of of they are of great benefit. But the issue is, is that the understanding is a little bit limited and we're just not in the position yet where the, the data coming off it is that easily accessible. And there needs to be a great degree of understanding. This is particularly with lactate, for example, where lactate is highly influenced by um, diet is highly influenced by substrate and you really have to be a very experienced um, technician to actually get a good lactate reading and get some good and get some good data from it and on the other side um hrv and resting heart rate i think for the response is really something that should be included in if, if you are interested in monitoring the response of how you're training um you've got great apps out there that can do this for you but then, and then training related testing, what we've already talked about with the heart rates and the um, and the five minute powers is, is really beneficial. Um, but then when it comes to performance testing, it's great to do when you have the time, it's expensive um, and subjective questions, for example, they can often be, um, they can often be a bit timely to do and often forgotten. So for me, it's really, you know, these, 
these are the key ones in terms of what I believe to be the, the key ones for um, most age group athletes to include in the training. And what I like to think of is a bit like this nice little sponge cake here is that, you know, if you're going to have one thing and you want something in your cake and the base layer, you really want that power, pace and heart rate to be included in all of your training aspects because you can do a lot with just that. You can even, I mean, if you're, if you're quite astute, you can even look at some, um, some resting heart rates and, um, and some maximal heart rates that are included in there as well. And then the response is like the icing on the cake. It kind of makes the cake. It's very important. You sh I would recommend that most, that most of my athletes, it was most of the age group athletes that I'm coaching will also be including some kind of HRV training within their training. And then last, the little bits on top, the SMO2s, the VO2 mats is like the sprinkles on the cake. And I think, you know, it's really good if you have the time. Obviously, we do it, I mean, we do it a lot with our training. We used the, we were using the Moxie yesterday with Chelsea. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of this is the, the way that I would like to look at that um the technology in today's age. Um Chelsea, what what have you got anything to say on I mean some of the technology that you're using in your day to day and how you find because we've used pretty much everything in our time I think we've tried and tested just about every device under the sun so um, Chelsea's no um she's no stranger to any of this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I think we were talking about this earlier. Sometimes the technology or the data that we're gathering is interesting, but it's not always super useful for what we're trying to accomplish. But what I use most often in my training is obviously power and pace, and that informs a lot of our our training. And then also, um, I think the HRV and resting heart rate are great for like looking at trends for how you're adapting to training. So we keep a close eye on those and Dan in particular, like keeps a close eye on how those are trending, but um, it's pretty rare that I'll wake up in the morning and we'll make like a quick training decision based on how my HRV or resting heart rate is looking in that moment. It's more um, to see how I'm adapting or not adapting very well to training over a certain period of time. Yeah. And if, if I just talk to that a little bit more, it's often, you know, we use data to um, inform decisions, not make decisions, I think is an important, important part of that. And, and, um, you know, my, like, like my PhD, my PhD supervisor taught me, he said, you know, when I was, because he was a very much an applied practitioner, he says, you know, are we, are we here for interesting or are we here for useful? And I think, you know, as, as sports scientists, particularly, we get too involved in the interesting. We collect so much data because we're interested and it's not often that useful for the athlete. And I think that's um, that's a really important consideration. And, and like just last week with Chelsea, you know, we gave her um, a bit of an easier weekend because the HRV wasn't trending in the right time. But also there was other things that was, you know, other telltale signs with some performance in training that we just felt that we just needed to take the gap, the foot off the pedal a little bit more just to um, just to get just to give her a bit of a back on the front foot and it worked really well and it was a real great way and an example of how we use that data to make the right decisions and um, and inform the training all right so last last topic here um i love this picture here this is chelsea you can't really see it but she's looking at me what are you making me do right now <laughs> um so this is um so this is last bit is um streamlining training focus so what can we do to um to make sure we're getting the most out of, out of our training this this slide here is one of the things um, that I always try to hold quite close to everything that I do. And it's this idea that there's things that matter and the things that you can, can control. And um, and then the really the part of what you can focus on is in the middle. So as a coach, for example, the training training matters a lot. And controlling the training is the best thing that I can do as a coach. Of course, there are other things that matter, but at the same time, I always like to think that I cannot control everything. And Chelsea, for example, has a lot of a lot of um, experts on her team who are controlling those things. And I have a lot of trust in the, the in those experts to not for me not to worry about it. And that's something that it not that it doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter to me. So I like to focus on what I can control and the things that matter for me, which is mainly the training as a coach. Of course, I have an, 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 an overview of everything, but um, but when it comes to this, it's the reason I'm bringing this up is because within different trainings, you have um, you have different aspects of physiology. So you might have like basic, so basic strength, um, VT1, your basic speed, VO2 max, second threshold, 
um, your economy, um, and what your fat metabolism is like. And, and these will change in accordance to the event that you are training for. So for example, like VO2 max is actually surprisingly important even for Ironman distance. And the research is pretty clear on that. So I always do laugh when I hear people say that VO2 max isn't important for Ironman. It actually is quite important for Ironman. So, but it's not as important for Ironman as it is for Olympic distance. And for example, economy and efficiency is more important for Ironman than it is for Olympic distance. Fat metabolism is more important for Ironman than it is for Olympic distance. But when it comes to the second threshold, much more important for Olympic distance than it is for Ironman. So this means that we can, if we, with this knowledge, we can focus on different training sessions at different times to, um, to make sure that we're eliciting the right results. So I'll, I'll bring this, I'll hopefully make this a little bit clearer as we get into some, an example of how we geared Chelsea's training up to, um, to, to the right, to, to Ironman New Zealand. But it's, it's all about making what matters most matter most at the right times. And this actually might even change. And I believe this does change as we get a little bit older. So for example, as we, if we just focus purely on the Ironman distance, as we get older, strength becomes more important. As you can see the bar, I've moved it up, a little, it comes higher. And so does VO2 max. And some of the other aspects are generally set in place and they're not as important as they once were. So for, for an older athlete, a master's athlete, Focusing on more high intensity and strength in the lead up to a race would be something that I would definitely consider as an absolute key requirement. But if it's um, if it's a, a younger athlete who's naturally quite strong, the strength training would naturally just come away as we get towards towards a race and we would focus less on that. And you might even include more speed, pure speed as a for an older athlete compared to a younger athlete who's naturally stronger, naturally has more speed. So um so, so th that's that's where we can start to really focus on making what matters most matter most at the right time, and this is just an example of some of the the training that um that we that we did with Chelsea in the lead up to the Ironman. So, given that we started in this kind of early phase, it was quite an early season race of Ironman New Zealand. So we started quite away from the the key determinants or the specifics of the Ironman with a lot of anaerobic capacity and speed work early in the year. And as we move forward, we moved into some more short VO2 max. Short VO2 max would be sessions like 30 on, 30 off, 40 on, 20 off. Anything under a minute generally is what classifies short VO2 max. Great intervals because they're one of the ones that really do touch on nearly all aspects of physiology. They've got a good neuromuscular component. They have a good anaerobic component and they have a good aerobic component. I really like these for early season to, to for nice holistic look, look at the physiology. And then from there, we kind of moved, we kept everything the same, but we started to introduce a little bit, moving those intervals a little bit higher, not really long, but getting towards a minute and into two minutes, um, which is moving towards a long VO2 max. We know that that's therefore going to be helping with the gross efficiency. We know that the longer intervals, maximum aerobic power intervals help with gross efficiency as well. And then by now we're starting to get into some racing. So now the training becomes more specific towards the event. So we, we're starting to include some like um, some tempo work. We're introducing the strength endurance. The strength endurance is a, it's all around Ironman 70.3 power, but at a low cadence. So it's a really good precursor for the last phase of training where we're really getting into the the um, vt1 and the efficiency and of course that vo2 mass development because that was something that was quite specific to us at the time to um to get that done um but the two things is like when it comes to training i don't know if anyone's ever heard of the principles of training but one of the principles of training is always a principle of specificity or that's quite commonly known now as demand driven training so it's really important to know the determinants of the event you're training for. And that's, you know, as I, as I pointed out in the slides before, it's, it's, um, you know, there's a lot to think about, but it really comes down to boiling down to probably three key aspects and, um, and making sure that you are doing the, um, the, you know, the, the said principle specific adaptation of imposed demands to elicit the correct responses for whatever you are training for. Um, so, that's the end of that for me. I know I mentioned the squad on the way through here, but um, if you are interested in Enduro IQ and you want to check it out, um, we do have an Enduro IQ training squad, which we're now in Training Peaks. Um, with that, you do get the um, you do get free access to the Training Peaks premium plan, 
um, and we've got more than 150 training plans in there, thousands of workouts. And we also have access to, um, to, to me and the coaches every week on webinars similar to this, I guess, where you can ask as many questions as you like over that session. And we also have explanation videos of, you can see swim drills and, um, and strength videos as well, uh, which is all linked within training peaks, which is, uh, really awesome. Um, for those of you who are on this call, uh, and you want to check it out we're doing a special promo for you which is uh you can use the coupon you can use the coupon code squad 50 and you'll get 50 percent off for the first uh month and you can just check it out via that website and um thanks for listening and i guess we got a few questions matt yes dan more than a few uh so we will try to get through as much as possible here um but yeah thank you for that um and again we'll have a um, we'll have some post webinar communications out later this week through email um as well as through the endure iq team um as well in, in the coming weeks so uh that link that that dan just shared um you'll have access to that um and that special offer um so yeah let's get into questions um we've had a lot of masters athletes join us um today um, um, so we had a lot of questions around just specifics um, to what you uh, spoke to um, here today um, for the 60, 65 plus athletes. So Dan, I guess, starting with you, um, like I said, several questions around this, trying to kind of like summarize all of them. What what are like the key aspects of things that you would change for um, that portion of age group athletes? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously not quite towards the 65 age myself but I mean just give my my own example um I mean when it when I did Kona in 2018 I was in my mid 30s um I took a bit of hiatus and then I then I came back and into my 40s and tried to to race again and um and one of the main things that I changed in that program was um strength training and I think as we age one of the main things that that goes is um vo2 max dwindles quite quickly um and it needs to be maintained and also our strength goes as well like if you if you if you ask a lot of coaches whether strength's important for ironman um it's pretty all the many coaches are on the fence but i think it's for younger athletes who are naturally quite strong and uh, you know can be quite injury free like when i was coaching jan van berkel for example did no strength training ever but he was so naturally strong he just didn't need it he never saw a physio he never got injured um it was quite remarkable but the main thing as we're aging, we need to include a little bit more high intensity. So that kind of level five work. And I would sprinkle that all the way through the year. I would never, I would never do a week without a day of um of VO2 max work, whether they're short intervals or long intervals. I think starting with shorter intervals and moving into the long intervals is is best. And also have a structured um strength training program in there as well. Um I I, I believe that. One of the main things that I did as I went to 41 and I and I started racing again is I included the strength training as well. And I've seen a lot of my older age group athletes who I coach one-on-one -on -one definitely include um, the strength training. But I think what's really important is that you get some proper guidance on it and it's done, it's done correctly as well with a proper periodized approach. Perfect. Um, next, this question is for Chelsea. It's around motivation. It comes from Tim out of the UK. So he did a 70.3 last year, came in just uh, six minutes over the cutoff uh, for the bike leg. He was devastated um, because of this. So his question is, how do you overcome the mental barriers um, and fear of a repeat result that ultimately ends up crippling um, your motivation for training? Oh, that's so tough. I think oftentimes, though, we learn the most from the days that don't go well. And I I really see that in my own career. Um, last year was a super challenging year for me, actually. And, and Kona in particular um, didn't go the way that I wanted. But it gave me and it gave my whole team this opportunity to, like, check in on the things that were going well and the things that we needed to improve on and like, I really feel that I get this opportunity to reinvent myself um, and and dive into what I could have done better or, um, you know, what my team can do better to, to help me find success in the way that I want. And and it's it really is all about, like, your attitude. I think I, um, I can get really down on myself and be really hard on myself. 
And so I like to surround myself people with people who are really positive and can always find the silver linings in, in situations. So I, I would just like encourage you to, as we say uh, on my crew, have an attitude adjustment maybe about, um, yeah, how difficult that situation was, but maybe it's actually a gift and this opportunity to like reevaluate and, and reinvent yourself as an athlete. Um, let's see, we had a lot of stuff around nutrition. Um, again, we'll get like super specific with that, but Dan, any, any advice there on kind of the ideal fueling practices? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a long winded, a, a long question. Um, I think it, it depends on, it, it depends on so many things. I mean, my, my philosophy is, I know that there's a lot towards, in the literature now that more more is better but my my philosophy is less is less is better i think as a as an athlete you need to kind of figure out what is the minimum amount you can you can take whilst being successful and that's that's different for everyone it's dependent on subset metabolism it's dependent on how fast you're going it's dependent on how much power you're doing it's dependent on how many calories you're doing i think it's a mistake to just go and copy um copy some pro and go for 120 grams an hour because that's what's that what that's what they're doing like um you'll be surprised at how much how little chelsea takes during her ironmans i'm, I'm sure i i'm sure chelsea would be happy to talk to that a little bit more as well yeah absolutely i think um we've talked about this a lot dan that there is this trend that more taking on more and more carbs is is better per, for performance but the reality is that you actually can't metabolize 120 grams of carbs an hour. Um, and that's really hard on your gut. And so especially in, you know, an event like Kona where the conditions are really harsh, it's super hot and humid that leaves us open to tons of risk, GI distress risk. Um, so, so I actually am closer to like 50 or 60 grams of carbs an hour. Um, I'll front load like a little bit the first hour of the bike, but then, yeah, I'm taking in 50 to 60 grams of carbs an hour, which is half of what a lot of my competitors are taking. Um, but the way that I train um, allows me to do that. And I haven't had, I've never bonked in a marathon in Ironman. Like my issue at the end of the marathon has never been an energy problem. Um, so yeah, that's the approach we take. I mean, and just to add to that, like, like if you look at Chelsea's splits in the in the marathons, you know, usually her her last ten k is her strongest ten k a lot of the time, you know, com comparatively. So it's definitely not, you know, we're definitely not running out of energy. And 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 if anyone's interested, I've written so much on this topic. And there's a little, if you go to Enjoy IQ website, there's a lot on um, there's a lot in this topic. And um, I probably um, I probably talk about it too much to be honest. I'm sure people are sick of me talking about it, but there's. A lot on there. There's a lot of recent articles in there, so do do check it out and have a have a good read to uh, to get more more insights and um and and ideas around that. And I was thinking, just what the last thing is that I think you know there's a big difference between um Ironman, which is a single day event, and multiple multiple day tour stage racing. It's very different because with an with a stage race, you're actually you're loading to prepare yourself for the next day as well. So the, the, the completely different things. So those two things cannot be compared. Um, and what we're talking about within the context of what Chelsea and I, and this, this forum is single day events, which is a one off Ironman. So, yeah. Uh, so this next one comes from Paul Gardner. Um, where does, uh, where does Dan put technique competence or mastery in the hierarchy of training and how much time do athletes even like Chelsea spend on maximizing that sweet spot of marginal gains, natural talent, biomechanics, and what works? Yeah, we, we do spend, so that's a great question. And obviously, um, we do spend a lot of time on technique, um, specifically swimming technique, of course, and it's dependent on the athlete. I mean, we typically, like, if I just talk to Chelsea, we don't do any work on her running technique. Um, we do a lot of work on her bike position um, as well. Um, so we spend a lot of time on that. Actually, I just I didn't really include it in the in the in the um, presentation because we was more focused on the physiology. But we typically focus on that. The technique swimming we'll do all year round. There's at least one technique swim session a week. Um, we depend quite highly on um, expertise in that area. So we have Paul Newsom, who's a 
friend of mine from Swim Smooth, who um, he was actually here in New Zealand just the other week, who was helping Chelsea specifically with some swimming technique and technique in the open water. Um, so we do, yeah, we focus on that that quite quite heavily, and um, and I'd say to say that we just focus on it once and that's it throughout the year. I don't think that's true. I think we focus on it most heavily at the start of the year when we have a bit more time, but it's a continuous evolution of, of improvement. We never, we never stop trying to improve in terms of everything that we're doing. And that's in, from, from the equipment to the training, to, to every kind of aspect of performance. Awesome. Um, some couple things around hrv we'll pick this one out um what percent decrease in hrv uh, can an athlete expect to see post ironman or 70.3 events and when would we expect to see a return to baseline hrv yeah so this is this is a this is a great question so one of the one of the apps that i use as well as training peaks to the monitor the hrv is i use um there's a hrv for training have their own app as well um, so I use that he quite heavily um, to look at substantial changes at the same time. When it comes to HRV, from there is there was the paper that was published by uh, Martin Richette, who's my PhD supervisor, and he and it's about it's more about um, what is a substantial change in HRV than um, than than how much. And for most people, a six percent reduction is a is quite a substantial change. So um, so typically. You know, most of these apps will will um will be will give you some sort of um alert, and it might be a red or something, and they're mainly based around your own. You, that's why many of them will have some kind of assessment period to give you your own baseline before it before it will tell you what the, that jump is or the, what the big difference is. Um, so it's, yeah, it's usually it's usually around that, and and the bounce the bounce back is it's um it can it can be quite quick but that's not to say that you're ready to i mean it's just one aspect of your recovery right so hrv is only measuring your autonomic nervous system there's so many other aspects of recovery and if you look at the time course of recovery of various areas of physiology you've got muscle glycogen depletion you've got autonomic nervous system rebalance you've also got muscle soreness and muscle damage muscle soreness and muscle damage takes longer by far and that can take up to like you know 10 days or 2 weeks so it's impossible to just depend on HRV as one recovery metric. It's it's quite a good one on the day today, but after something like an Ironman where you have substantial muscle damage, I'll be focusing on a more holistic approach. And HRV would be my one of them, but you also might, might look at your resting heart rate, your sleep quality, and also how sore your legs are, and also your motivation to train. I think a really important one with my athletes is that if they don't feel if they had a rest period and they don't feel like training yet, generally. We, I don't encourage them to train again. I think that motivational factor is um, quite important too. Perfect. Uh, had a couple of questions. Seems like we have a lot of time strapped athletes right now. Surprise there on the call. Um, so can you just speak to that about trying to work, uh, work training in to just a time crunch schedule specifically during uh, the weekdays and, and, and work days? Yeah. I mean, I think I, I can definitely talk to this. I mean, you know, I've I've I'm a I'm a busy, you know, I work at a university, I coach professionals, I run a company and I've got two kids. So, you know, I was in all my time, I was always quite time strapped. But I think it's also dependent on how flexible your time is as well. Um, like nine till five jobs where you have to be at a certain place at a certain time, it's a little bit different to um if you're kind of a little bit more flexible with your working hours. So I mean, what I always found very beneficial was I would I and mean, what this isn't the best way to train, but it did work for me. Was you can I used to cram my training into the early part of the day, so I would literally get up at five thirty, uh, get up at five. I'll be in the pool at five thirty. I'd train till seven, and I'd literally do back to back sessions because I found that from a productivity pro productivity standpoint, um, it was quite. Um, I found it quite time consuming to rest and then get changed and do it again. So I'd almost do them back to back to back, and I find that's quite an efficient way to train, and also. If you consider that's kind of what we do as triathletes as well is that we typically do do back-to-back -back sessions quite a lot so i would often you know i would be it would be like by 10 o'clock i'd be starting work and other than a 5k swim and a two-hour run sort of thing you know close to close to and i find that to be to be pretty beneficial um but when it comes but 
it comes back to that last part of the presentation is knowing knowing what sessions within the week are the most important for you as an athlete and what you're trying to achieve. Um, and you might have a 15 hour program, but I think you have to know what, I think it's quite important that the coach that you're working with or whatever, whoever you're working with um, itemizes the most important sessions of the week. So you know what you can miss and what you can't, what you, you can't really miss. Um, I think that's, that's kind of the most Im important thing. I mean, the bottom line is uh, I do believe that if you look at the research, you know, training is a dose response relationship. It's quite simple as that is that the more training you do, the bigger the dose, the bigger the response. Um, there is no, there is no hiding from that, but, but where it does come back to it is that if you, the specific adaptation of imposed demands rules, you have to make sure that the training you're doing is not junk and not, and not specific to what you're trying to do. So, you know, a VO2 max interval really is a VO2 max interval. A threshold interval really is a threshold interval. And you're not doing um, a threshold interval to a higher intensity and it turns into a VO2 max. I think they're really important things for age group athletes to really get a handle of, which is that point at the side of the presentation where, you know, get some proper testing, get your training zones and prescribe the training effectively is really important. Perfect. Um, we had some training peak specific uh, questions. I'll uh, pick this one from Simon. We'll start with Chelsea on this one. What what are you know some some metrics that you pay attention to in training peaks uh, the most? Um, and then yeah yeah we'll we'll follow up with Dan to to answer that as well. Like what what features or components of, of training peaks do you uh, mm -hmm. index on the most? Yeah, like the external um, HRV and resting heart rate app that I use is integrated into training peak. So like every single day, that's like the first thing on my schedule when I record it in the morning. So it's great to have that like integrated in to, you know, the interface that I'm seeing. And then like the data I use most frequently is power and, and pace. So, um, yeah, not like super complicated, but, uh, yeah, that's what I'm using. And then of course, like we have all of like the bike sessions from Endure IQ are linked um, through Training Peaks to Zwift. So I use that quite a lot. And Dan, same question. Yeah, I mean, I guess my, my I'm a little bit more on the analytical side. I'm in the dashboard quite a lot. Obviously, I'm building programs and and everything, so I'm I'm just doing that generally. But the um, but especially I I do like the I mean I like the performance management chart within context of what you're trying to do. Um, I think it's um I think it does tell quite a lot in conjunction with HRV and resting heart rate. So, you know, I'll often look at that and you know if the TSB is really low, um, and the resting heart rate and the resting heart rate high and HRV is low, then you know that's that's a really good indicator indicator for me so i'll um i'll often be in that um recently i've been used i've been using the um i've been getting into wko5 a little bit more as well to do some more analytics so we just got access to that which has been really helpful and also um like recently because we were using the moxie the within the dashboard using the scatter plot function to actually plot the moxie and drop it under a chart of heart rate and power and then you can actually see some of the physiological changes so yesterday for example chelsea did 10 by three minute intervals i made a scatter plot from the smo2 data from the moxie put it under the chart of heart rate and and um and power and i could you know i could see how what was happening throughout the session and you know there's the, that, that's some of the other things that I'm, I'm using quite frequently as well perfect um let's see So Chelsea, what's the most recent new tech item that you've adopted um, and how has that made a meaningful difference for you? Oh man, I'm trying to remember exactly what the most recent, I, you know, I've become like a little more attached to my aura ring action in the past six months or so. Um, traditionally, we have recorded my HRV on the HRV app, but I'm I'm trying to be more diligent with my sleep hygiene and I don't want to look at my phone first thing in the morning um, to record my HRV. So I'm recording it all on my aura ring and then like, you know, an hour after I wake up in the morning, then I'll like update it. And 
in the app. So the Aura Ring is linked to the HRV app, which is linked to Training Peaks, and that require it sounds like a lot, but it requires nothing of me. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which yeah, is what a- I like. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because when I was uh, before, I, and also when you have children, I find that wearables become a lot better for the HRV because you can use something called PPG technology, which isn't really HRV. It's looking at your pulse variability using the finger on the, the, the camera on the back of an iPhone. Um, but you ne- And it's actually the best way to take it. If I was going to choose any way that you would take it, that would be the best thing to do is in the morning, sit up, take it, take it on with a heart rate strap or just that specific time. Because the problem with nighttime readings is that the nighttime readings can often be... Um, can often be influenced by what you did late that night. So if you trained late, you ate late, it's going to affect your HRV during the night. So by the time you get to the morning, it's kind of, it's gone away and you get a better reading. But when, once you have children, you cannot guarantee that you will have that spare one minute of peace and tranquility to record HRV. So um, you know, Chelsea's the same, I'm the same. So this is where Aura Ring and Whoop and these wearables can really come into fruition and um, be of massive benefit. And what happens is that Chelsea, she records it on the Aura Ring that syncs with the HRV for training app and the HRV for training app directly syncs with um, training piece. So it's just one press of a button in HRV for training, syncs the data, and then that's automatically going to training piece. So it's, it's quite... Um, you know, that, that, oh, we talked about cost benefit analysis. It's um, a pretty low on the um, on the on the cost for sure. I was going to add to you know, like like Dan said, we've tried so many um, different technologies at this point between like the Moxie Monitor and the VO2 Master, and of course, like we use lactate testing and all these things. But it's so often like the data is just confirming what we already new from like more basic measurements like what we're seeing in my power and heart rate numbers or you know in my like recovery metrics and of course it's like interesting to see some of these in more like specific specific ways but oftentimes like the really basic technologies that we're using are like the most effective yeah i mean it's it's often it's often just um giving us more certainty in some of the decisions we make around training, which I think is um, pretty pretty important. We are almost at time here. Do we want to do one or two more? I'm happy to do one or two more. We'll do one or two more. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Just got some training to do, but <laughs> um, so we have uh, power and pace, both cycling and running. So I, I think really like they're asking about uh, power for running. It seems like and and just the importance there. Yeah, yeah. I I haven't really gone down the power. Um. So we've used Stride. We've used Stride a lot for monitoring. Um. For like assessment of particularly of trainers. Um. And stuff. Um. We use Stride when we're on the treadmill. Um. Because we find that quite helpful. But I mean the power number is is. In my in my opinion, it's not that different to normalized graded pace. Normalized graded pace gives you, is giving you is given to you in training piece. I think power running we do have that in this squad. We have those zones set some power running zones, but it's mostly useful when you're doing like undulating tempo runs or hill efforts or something like that. But um, I I say it's something that we it's certainly not on the shoe for every single run. I mean Chelsea had it on her shoe yesterday, for example. Um, but we use it sometimes when required, but not always. And then we had a lot of questions around the HRV app that you mentioned, Dan. Um, I, I think a lot of people didn't catch the name of that. So if you don't mind repeating it. Yeah, it's um, HRV for the number four um, training. Yeah, Marco Altini. All right. And then... A real good one here. How long does the stimulus needs to be to see if we are responding correctly to it? Hmm. Um, minimum. This is a good a good question, but it will be a minimum of three weeks. Yeah, three weeks, and you you at least want to be touching that stimulus two times per week, really. Um, that's what, that's the kind of my go-to rule is, um, you know, three, three, um, three weeks of, uh, 
of a of a of a session um, as a good progression as a minimum can be up to six. But generally, uh, you can see some pretty big differences, and the research is quite clear: is that loss of training intervention studies um, are of three weeks of duration for that reason, because you can generally see pretty substantial changes within three weeks. We had a we had a study that was done um, looking at the differences between training in ambient and, and um, hot conditions, and we saw massive differences in just three weeks. So you can see differences in that time period. Um. We still had a lot more around like the time strap thing, maybe for Chelsea, because I know I think Dan did a great job of answering that. But this specific one um, from an anonymous attendee said, what key strategies uh, to be productive at work? I, I'll extend that to just in life. Um, when uh, when you ran at uh, 21K earlier in the morning or went through two training sessions or you started work. So ba basically just trying to balance the mindset and 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 be able to um kind of refocus on things yeah i mean i'm not time strapped in the same way that a lot of amateur athletes are but um i am more time strapped than a lot of professional athletes uh you know i have i'm a mom of a young toddler and i have uh, a lot of help with that but um, i don't have a lot of like time to recover like i did before um before kids, I think the things that have made me like have been most beneficial to me are like being really on top of um, my sleep hygiene. Um, and then also, um, like we were talking about earlier, you know, making the most important thing the most important thing. Like, I just don't, I think I'm really on top of the little things, but not in the same way that maybe I was before kids or I've just like simplified a bit more you know I used to be doing like I I would do like an hour of like rehab before going to bed before and now I just realized like that's not the most important thing for me sleep is the most important thing for me and do like a little bit of you know activation before and after I train um and and so yeah I like to like clump my exercise my training like in very specific periods and then when I'm done training you know I'm done I don't know if that answered your question very well. <laughs> I don't know if they're responding, but I, I think so. Um, so <laughs> we are at five after. We are over. Um, thank you. <laughs> time uh dan and chelsea and thank you so much for being a part um of this webinar um obviously we weren't able to get to every single question but i think we did uh hit on kind of the key highlights there um again there will be follow-ups um you can uh, reach out to the endure iq team uh, you can reach out uh, to me directly and the um information is in that uh, confirmation email if you have training peaks related questions um we will uh, do our best to to follow up with you and, and answer those so um and and yeah uh, thank you so much uh dan and chelsea again for for being a part of this today and uh, uh thank you everyone for joining no thank you thank you very much thanks so much we do um i have reached out to a few of my partners oh, so yeah, partners. Um, yeah oh. we're gonna be giving away we're gonna be giving away uh a few things um we're gonna give away three defense packs from pillar performance we're going to give away two pairs of Sun God sunglasses, a $250 gift, dollar gift card to The Feed, and two pairs of shoes from On. And um, we, so a pretty like good lineup there. Yeah. Matt is going to randomly pick, um, pick the recipients from the people who actually did show up here to the presentation today. So thank you so much for being here and uh, we appreciate you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, awesome. We we do. Yeah. We have that separate list if you actually attended live today. So yeah, we'll be picking for that. So yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for oh, Awesome. Thanks, team. Ciao, ciao.